Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vantage Seminar. This is our series on developments in isogeny-based cryptosystems. And today, we're very happy to have Wouter Kastrik talking about an efficient key recovery attack on the supersingular isogeny Diffie-Hellman. And uh, Wouter, is it all right if we video this talk? Uh, yes, that's fine. Okay, well, please go ahead. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Okay, uh, so thanks a lot, uh, Rachel, for the introduction and Rachel and Drew for the invitation. Uh, so it's a uh, yeah, pleasure to talk at this uh, seminar series uh, on joint work uh, that I did with uh, Thomas de Cru, uh, in which we uh, uh, found a, a key recovery attack. So an attack basically on the super singular isogeny diffie hellman uh, problem. Uh, now, because it's uh, a mixed uh, audience, I will uh, uh, explain what super singularly uh, the, what the super singular isogeny Diffie-Hellman protocol is from a viewing point uh, that is maybe a little bit atypical, but that highlights uh, the the special features of uh, of the super singular isogeny Diffie-Hellman. But I will start calling it SIDH <clears throat> that uh, made it uh, vulnerable to this type of attack. Uh, but roughly, on a high level, the idea of, uh, is everyone, by the way, familiar with the classical uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange? So this is in a, let me quickly uh, uh, explain this so that we're all uh, on the same page. So if two parties, Alice and Bob, in classical Diffie-Hellman want to agree on a common secret, what they do is they uh, agree uh, basically on a generator of a cyclic group. So let's say generate by G, I will use multiplicative notation here. Then Alice picks a secret integer Z A, raises G to the power A, sends that result to Bob. Bob picks a secret B, raises B, G to the power B, and sends the result to Alice. Um, and then uh, both parties can now compute uh, G to the AB, because Alice can compute this as the G to the B that she received from uh, Bob, and raises it raised to her own secret power A, and uh, Bob can take the G to the A that he received from Alice and raise it to his own secret power uh, B. So this is the classical uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol that is being used uh, uh, billions of times uh, every day worldwide. Um, but the disadvantage, and this is the big context uh, for uh, SIDH, is that this is, uh, yeah, the, the security here relies on extracting uh, um, or, or, or to break the system, it suffices to extract A uh, from G to the A. Or, or A modulo the order of G. Uh, and this is something that quantum computers can do. So this is something that, uh, that Shor's algorithm uh, can do. And so in the post-quantum era, this is uh, no longer uh, an option. Okay, so SIDH, the design of SIDH uh, fits within this uh, search for alternatives to, uh, to Diffie-Hellman, uh, to classical Diffie-Hellman. And so uh, Zhao and Defeo in 2011 started uh, wondering whether uh, one can do Diffie-Hellman with subgroups and quotients. So this is the high level picture. Uh, so Alice and Bob, uh, now instead of uh, on a cyclic group, they basically agree on a, on a set or a class or a category of uh, uh, a class of groups, if you want, and they uh, pick a, a, a group in there. Let's call it E. This is, of course, suggestive notation because this will become an elliptic curve later on. I know Alice chooses a secret subgroup A in this um, uh, of this group E. Bob chooses a secret subgroup B of this group E. And now Alice computes the quotient. So let's, uh, because everything is abelian, I don't have to worry about normal uh, subgroups, normality of subgroups. Uh, so she just computes E modulo A. This is a high level uh, description. Of course, you have to wonder how, how does she do that? But she computes E modulo A, sends that group to Bob. Bob computes E modulo B, sends that group to Alice. And now the idea is that both parties can compute E modulo, uh, the group spanned by A and B. Indeed, Alice can compute this as the E modulo B that she received from Bob and uh, quotient it out further. But this is again, uh, not, a, not exact uh, terminology in a problematic way. I will get back to that in a second. But she quotients, quotients it out further by her secret subgroup A. Bob uh, takes the E modulo A that he received from Alice and quotients it out further by his own secret subgroup. Okay, and then the idea is that both parties have quotiented out E by uh, A plus B. 
But of course, how do we make sense of this? Because A is not a subgroup of E modulo B. A is a subgroup. Uh, uh, yeah, you, you have to somehow tell to to uh, to Alice how she can view A as a subgroup of E modulo B. So somehow you have to tell uh, you have to give these quotient maps uh, along with this quotient. Okay, so Alice has to send uh, this quotient map uh, to Bob. Yeah, and then this allows Bob to uh, to view B as a subgroup of E modulo A, and the same for Alice, uh, uh, the same for Bob. So he has to send his quotient up. And now uh, Alice can view her own secret group A as a subgroup of E modulo B. But this is problematic. I'm sorry, I overwrote this uh, uh, accident, uh, on, not on purpose, but uh, I hope you can still read it. So there is a big problem with this um, because uh, in practice, if you give this quotient map in any reasonable way, you will also give the kernel of that map. Um, and uh, the kernel of that map is supposed to be uh, secret. Okay, so that doesn't uh, work. Yeah, so uh, this is high level idea uh, has issues. I know the big thing, the big insight that Zhao and the FEO had in 2011 is that one can get around this by using uh, auxiliary points. And you have to remember this work because this will be uh, crucial. So what is the idea to uh, to make this work? So instead of just agreeing on a starting group E, uh, Alice and Bob will also agree on four points, um, P, A, and Q, A, for group elements. P, A, and Q, A, they will be used uh, to generate Alice's secret subgroup A, and P, B, and Q, B, uh, that will be used to generate Bob's secret subgroup B. How do they do that? Well, Alice chooses a secret scalar A, and generates her secret subgroup as the group generated by PA and A times uh, plus A times QA. Okay, so this is going to be a cyclic subgroup. You can think of, of this as like a, a rank two thing generated spanned by PA and QA, and she chooses a secret rank uh, one subgroup in there. And Bob does the same. Okay, and now instead of uh, giving uh, the quotient map, uh, Alice will just give this quotient group and the images of these uh, auxiliary points for Bob under her under her quotient map. Okay, so she gives E modulo A and then the images of PB and QB. Bob does the same. He sends E modulo B to Alice and gives uh, to Alice the images of Alice's auxiliary points under his uh, secret uh, quotient map by B. And now uh, this works. How does this work? Well, remember, uh, Alice somehow has to manage uh, to, to be able to view her own uh, secret group inside E modulo B. But thanks to these uh, auxiliary uh, images, uh, this works because uh, phi B of A, and because this is a group homomorphism, uh, can be written as the group generated by phi B of PA. This is one of these points that Bob sends plus A times phi B of QA. And this is the other point that Bob sends. Okay, so Alice can really compute phi B of A, and likewise for B. So this is the high level uh, <coughs> view on uh, super singular isogeny diffie hellman And just uh, for concreteness, let's now uh, explain uh, what this looks like uh, more concretely. So um, Alice and Bob will actually not work in the category of groups, but will work in the category of algebraic groups. Okay, so this, uh, this uh, yeah, I, I will mention something about that in a second. Uh, so they uh, more concretely work in the in the class of super singular uh, elliptic curves over fp squared and p is a prime of a very special form uh, basically for what i'm going to say today you can ignore this uh, but the prime is chosen of this form uh, for all these points that will be uh, sent along to be nicely defined over fp squared again okay so that's the reason for this uh, special special prime p but for the but that's the only reason and so as i said um alice's uh, auxiliary points will now be generators of a uh, well, as written here, sorry, Alice's auxiliary points will be generators of the two to the e torsion for some uh, some exponent e, not too small, and Bob uh, will choose generators uh, of the three to the f torsion again for some not too small power of three, two to the e and three to the f are roughly uh, understood to be of the same size. And now this is the scheme from uh, the previous slide. So Alice chooses the secret uh, a. Uh, considers the subgroup generated uh, by uh, PA plus A times QA. So this is a subgroup of the two to the E torsion, a cyclic subgroup of the two to the E torsion on E. Uh, she now computes this quotient. Now a quotient uh, uh, of elliptic curves, this, uh, this is a 
done by, by uh, considering the isogeny with kernel A. So she considers uh, the isogeny phi A uh, with kernel uh, the A that she chose. And this is the reason for working in the with two to the E torsion. So this is a two to the, uh, an isogeny of degree two to the E. So this is a very big isogeny to compute, but you can compute it as a composition of uh, E uh, two isogenies. And this is efficient. So that's the reason for working with this two to the E torsion. And then Bob does the same, uh, but with uh, uh, as a composition of three isogenies. So this is again uh, efficient. And, uh, for the rest, this slide is just a copy of the previous slide. And now uh, uh, Alice and Bob can indeed uh, compute this uh, this quotient. So Alice computes it uh, as the E modulo B she received from uh, Bob modulo phi B of A, as explained before. And Bob does the same. Okay, and now both have found this uh, elliptic curve, and this is now uh, an isomorphism as uh, as elliptic curves, so not not nearly as good groups. So it's a stronger uh, form of isomorphism. Uh, and for instance, they can then work with the J invariant of this curve uh, as the common secret. Okay, now uh, here's a popular uh, alternative way of looking at this. Uh, so the uh, isogeny of Alice, uh, the secret isogeny of Alice phi a. Uh, from E to E modulo uh, A can be viewed as a secret walk in, uh, in what we call the super singular two isogeny graph. So what is this graph? Uh, well, we just um, plot all the uh, super singular elliptic curves over FP squared as vert up to, up considered up to isomorphism as vertices. And we uh, draw an edge between them whenever there is a two isogeny uh, connecting both. Okay, and so essentially this is an undirected graph because of the existence of dual isogenies. And Alice's uh, secret walk, as I said, decomposes as a composition of uh, two isogenies. So you can view it as a secret walk in this graph. Um, and uh, the security argument that was usually given for SIDH is that this graph is known to be a Ramanujan graph. So it has rapid mixing properties, meaning that in very few steps, uh, you are at uh, basically a uniformly random point. If you take a random, a short random walk, from uh, E, then uh, basically in a very few number of steps, in a logarithmic number of steps, you are at the uniformly random uh, place, essentially uh, in this graph. Okay, but key recovery is not just uh, finding a path in the graph, it's find, uh, finding a path uh, between uh, E and E modulo A in the graph. You also have these, uh, these, uh, these auxiliary points here, okay? So key recovery amounts to finding uh, this path or finding equivalently finding the secret subgroup A upon input of E, the starting point, E modulo A, the endpoint, and uh, the auxiliary points, the images of Bob's auxiliary points under Alice's secret isogeny. Yeah. And similarly for Bob, this is then a walk in the three isogeny graph. This is now a four regular graph because there are four outgoing three isogenies out of each vertex, essentially. And um, a key recovery for Bob, and this is on uh, what we will focus on uh, in this talk or, or in the attack, uh, amounts to extracting uh, phi B, the secret isogeny phi B, or the secret subgroup of Bob B, uh, upon input of the starting curve, the end curve E modulo B, and the images under Bob's secret isogeny of uh, Alice's uh, auxiliary points. And I want to restress that this uh, makes for an atypical isogeny problem. Okay, I didn't mention this yet. Uh, I, I, maybe I didn't stress this, but finding an isogeny between two isogenous, ellip isogenous elliptic curves is considered a very hard uh, computational problem. Uh, but it's the presence of these uh, this extra information, the images of these uh, auxiliary points that make it into an atypical uh, isogeny problem. Okay, so here's a quick timeline uh, of. Uh, of isogeny-based crypto maybe, uh, but at least uh, for uh, SIDH. So as I already said, uh, discrete logarithms uh, are easy to compute. Uh, so that's this extracting A from G to the A. Uh, for quantum computers and so classical uh, key exchange basically is broken uh, as soon as we would have a, a large and universal quantum computer. The start of isogeny-based crypto uh, was in 1997, but uh, only on a very small and uh, yeah and, and small yeah uh, among a few, this was only distributed among a few people. So Kuveni wrote a paper uh, um, containing the first isogeny-based key exchange protocol, uh, but the paper got rejected and was only uh, circulated among some uh, some friends and experts. 
Covenius scheme was rediscovered in 2006 and uh, by, by um, uh, Rostovtsev and Stolbonov. So Rostovtsev was uh, the supervisor of uh, Anton Stolbonov's uh, PhD thesis, which was exactly on this topic. Uh, so they re rediscovered Covenius protocol, they improved the construction, and they were the first uh, to, to suggest uh, post-quantum security. Okay. So Covenius didn't uh, do that. A more visible uh, start, I would say, for isogeny-based crypto was uh, a hash function that was proposed by Charles uh, Gordon and Lauters in the same year. Uh, and this is the first appearance of these uh, super singular isogeny graphs that I uh, plotted uh, on the previous slide. And then in 2010, and this is the direct uh, provocation for the design of SIDH, uh, is an attack by Charles, Zhao, and Sukarev on the schemes by Kuvenia and Rostovtsev and Stolbonov, which are of a really different type, uh, but, that, uh, but, the, but the attack runs in, uh, in, in sub-exponential time, but you need a quantum computer. But nevertheless, uh, this is considered, uh, yeah, this is an important result showing that uh, these are kind of suboptimal. And so uh, this is when uh, Zhao and Defeo started uh, to think uh, about an alternative this, uh, to this, uh, to this proposal by Kuvenia, Rostovtsev, and Stolbonov. And this is inspired by the super singular isogeny graphs from the Charles Gordon and Lauter hash function uh, came up. Oh, this is the context in, in which they came up with SIDH. Okay, at the time of uh, the proposal, uh, let me just mention that the, the best attacks uh, were exponential. So they ran in time, uh, classical, classically they ran in time, oh, uh, P to the one fourth, quantumly, uh, but uh, this is not a, this is also requires a lot of quantum memory. Uh, there's an attack that runs in uh, O uh, of P to the one over six, but still exponential. So this was the situation at the time of proposal. Uh, and then um, in uh, 2016, NIST, so the National Institute for Standards and Technology, uh, launched a call uh, for uh, new um, encryption schemes and digital signatures uh, that would replace uh, classical elliptic curve cryptography and RSA in the end. Uh, and, uh, and a system based on, based on SIGH was uh, submitted uh, and it went under the name Psych. Uh, then in 2017, um, for the first time, uh, it was shown that these auxiliary points indeed turn the uh, isogeny uh, finding problem in an atypical version of it. Uh, so he managed to exploit these auxiliary points uh, to find uh, a polynomial time attack in the case of very unbalanced parameters. So I said that 2 to the e is roughly 3 to the f. Uh, if that's not the case, so if 2 to the e is considerably larger than 3 to the f or the other way around, uh, uh, you can already use, it was already known how to use the auxiliary points for, uh, for breaking uh, SIDH. This was improved then uh, in a follow-up work uh, by many authors. Uh, but as I said, this only applies to unbalanced uh, parameters and so it had no impact on site. And in 2020, NIST selects uh, Psych as an alternate uh, round three candidate. This word alternate is, a, is very important. So uh, NIST uh, considers Psych to be a very promising and interesting scheme. And also they like the fact that it was based on isogenies and not on uh, like on lattices or codes uh, where most uh, proposals uh, had their, have their roots. Uh, so they like the diversification, say, of uh, the mathematical problems uh, underlying uh, cryptography, uh, but they they deem it too uh, exotic, say, and too new uh, uh, to to really uh, be a, a serious uh, round three candidate. So they put it in this alternative group for further investigation. Then two years later, NIST announced uh, winners, announced a first batch of winners. Uh, but the competition is not closed. Uh, they also opened the fourth round uh, for other schemes uh, to be uh, yeah, to be investigated further, and Psych uh, was among them. Uh, and then about one month or less than one month after this announcement, uh, we came up with uh, this attack, uh, and it breaks all uh, security level, levels of Psych. Uh, and we ran this on a on a 12-year-old computer, and everything was broken in less than a, half a day. So uh, it's uh, quite uh, devastating. Uh, and basically, theoretically, the attack uh, or a version of this attack is polynomial time if the starting curve has no endomorphism ring. I will talk a bit about that later. And if it doesn't have a known endomorphism ring, uh, you can still uh, play uh, the same game, but then the uh, running time is sub-exponential. Actually, we didn't uh, see this immediately, but uh, Defeo and Rizalovsky pointed this out to us. 
And then uh, everything was basically uh, concluded. All hope was gone uh, with a paper by Robert, uh, who establishes uh, polynomial runtime unconditionally. So even in the case of an unknown and the more um, But I will talk about other uh, related works uh, later on. Oh, I forgot to say this, but this is very important. Um, so yeah, Robert's work is really polynomial time unconditionally, but in our algorithm, uh, we need to compute some factorization. So we need to factor some, some large integers. Uh, uh, so these factorizations are not an issue in the case of psych. That's how we manage to do it. But asymptotically, uh, this will become a, a bottleneck for uh, our approach. Okay, so, but these factorizations only depend on, uh, on like this two to the E and this three to the F. So they are uh, pre-computable. Okay, um, now let's go uh, to the, the mathematics. So um, here is the key recovery problem from the viewpoint uh, or from the viewpoint of an attacker who wants to recover Bob's secret key. Okay, so Bob's secret key is this secret subgroup B or equivalently this secret isogeny phi B. And the information we have is the starting curve because that's public is Bob's uh, codomain curve because that's is sent to Alice. And other information that is sent across this channel is uh, are the images of Alice's two to the e torsion points uh, under Bob's secret isogeny. Okay. Now uh, the main uh, starting point for our attack is that uh, yeah is the following observation: uh, this starting curve, codomain curve, and these two points they allow us to consider uh, the following subgroup on the product of these two uh, elliptic curves. So we consider the product of E with E modulo B. This is an abelian surface. And on that abelian surface, we can consider the group uh, generated by uh, these two points. Okay, so I have a picture here. So this is this, a, this product abelian surface. It has E as a some kind of x-axis if you want. It has E modulo B, which from now on we will denote by a E prime as some kind of y-axis. And then we have uh, these two points living in here. So this is the point PA and it's, uh, so Alice is due to the E torsion point PA and it's image under Bob's secret isogeny. So this is this point. Uh, and then the same for the other, uh, the, the other basis point of the two to the E torsion, okay? So this data allows us to consider this. And then the question uh, we asked ourselves, or, or basically Thomas asked himself is, uh, what would happen if we quotient out this abelian surface by this subgroup? Okay. Now this subgroup is isomorphic to Z, and this is a point of order two to the E, because PA is a point of order two to the E and phi B has degree, uh, well, in any case, this is point order two to the E. Uh, this is uh, order two to the E, so it's a group generated by two points of order two to the E, so it's isomorphic to this group. And we, uh, yeah, we want to quotient out this uh, group by, uh, by this subgroup. Now, the problem is that we want to do this in the category of principally polarized abelian surfaces. Yeah? So inside the, the, the category of abelian, unpolarized abelian surfaces, this question has no chance of, of leading to something interesting. In fact, um, the type of uh, abelian surfaces that we will be dealing with are, uh, yeah, will all be isomorphic to a product of two elliptic curves. And such uh, abelian surfaces are called uh, a product of two super singular uh, elliptic curves. And such abelian surfaces uh, are super special. That's one of the definitions of super special if you want. And uh, as, an, as unpolarized varieties, they are all isomorphic. So the, there's nothing interesting happening. There's only one uh, super special abelian surface. Uh, but uh, with polarizations, this is a, a rich world. I will say more about that uh, in a second. But this has a consequence. If we want to play uh, the game in this uh, category, we have to modify this group a little bit uh, because uh, we want that this quotient, again, comes equipped in a natural way with the principal polarization. And uh, the best known uh, condition uh, ensuring that this happens is that the group is uh, so-called maximally isotropic with respect to the well pairing. Okay, so this is a subgroup uh, of the two to the e torsion. So there's this two to the e well pairing, and we want that uh, uh, the well pairing of uh, this point with this point uh, is trivial, basically. Uh, and this is will typically not be the case. Uh, but then you 
you can in practice or in a, in a, and definitely in the situation that we will consider later on you can scale uh, these second points such that this becomes maximally uh, isotropic uh, so this this has to be an e uh, sorry okay but this is a technical remark <clears throat> Uh, if the group satisfies uh, this maximal isotropy condition, uh, then uh, and it's isomorphic to this uh, to a group of this kind, we call it a two to the e uh, two to the e subgroup. So here's a note. Uh, so Thomas actually played around with this uh, idea um, uh, in the context uh, of uh, of a verifiable delay function that he tried to uh, construct, uh, and then. Uh, uh, Luciano uh, Maino, who well, Chloe will speak uh, next time, uh, who was visiting Leuven, uh, also helped uh, working on this uh, verifiable delay function. And this is the context in which uh, we then both came up with this, uh, uh, with, with the insight that at, at some point that uh, maybe it could be used to attack SIDH. But it's important to note that actually we liked SIDH a lot, and so destruction was never the uh, intention. Okay, so here, uh, here's what would happen or what you would expect to happen uh, if you quotient out this product of elliptic curves by this uh, two to the e, two to the e subgroup. So just like a two to the e isogeny between elliptic curves decomposes as a, as a composition of uh, two isogenies, and two to the e, two to the e isogeny decomposes uh, as a composition of e to two isogenies. Uh, and the typical thing that we expect is the following. The first two to isogeny, you typically expect that it will not take us to another product of elliptic curves, but it will take us to a generic uh, abelian uh, uh, surface. Um, and a generic abelian surface uh, is, a, is, a, is the Jacobian of a genus two curve. So that's what we expect. And then we expect to stay inside that world. Okay, so this is, uh, this is uh, the expected picture. However, in very exceptional situations, and the heuristic probability is uh, about one over p, I will explain that in a second, uh, you might encounter uh, a product of elliptic curves uh, along the way. For instance, uh, in the last step, you might encounter a product of elliptic curves. Why is this heuristic probability about one over p? Well, uh, over or in characteristic p, there are about uh, p, uh, cubed over uh, 2,880 um, super special abelian surfaces and about uh, p squared over uh, 288 of them uh, are products of elliptic curves. Okay, so the ratio of products of elliptic curves among all super special uh, uh, principally polarized abelian surfaces is about one over p or 10 over p if you want, uh, want to be more precise. So that's why it's a very exceptional situation because p will be very big in our cases. Okay, if we run that situation, then the subgroup is called uh, reducible. Okay, now the uh, whole idea behind the attack that eventually came is to force ourselves in this exceptional situation uh, to use uh, uh, data, uh, known data, to force ourselves in this exceptional situation and use this uh, as a uh, somehow a decision tool, but I will explain that uh, in a second. Uh, but the key uh, theoretical ingredient uh, into uh, which allowed us to do this is uh, is this uh, theorem by Kani from 1997. And what Kani did was basically uh, uh, describing a criterion that recognizes uh, this situation. Okay, so he 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 uh, gave a group. So. We are quotienting out this two to the e two to the e subgroup, and Kani uh, explained uh, to us uh, in this paper how to recognize uh, if a group will be reducible. So if you will land on a product of elliptic curves or not. So basically, uh, the characterization is as follows. So the the thing that goes into it is what he calls an isogeny diamond configuration of order n. What is this? This is a triplet. Psi G1, G2. Psi is an isogeny. Okay, so uh, you should think of this as our starting curve again. This is uh, the ending curve, e major OB again. And Psi is, a, is this isogeny. So you should think of this for the moment, but we'll modify this uh, as uh, Bob, uh, Bob's secret isogeny. And now um, and, uh, these groups G1, G2, what they have to do is they basically have to span uh, uh, the kernel of this isogeny in an 
some an, in an orthogonal way, say. So they should be uh, they should intersect trivially, and uh, uh, together they should span the kernel of uh, psi. Okay. I'm uh, sweeping separability uh, issues. So I'm assuming everything is separable here. Uh, and this will always be the case uh, for the parameters that we are studying. And then this n, this is the number of elements uh, of G1 plus the number of elements of G2. Okay. And then a slightly informal way of uh, stating Carney's theorem is the following. So if you have an n, n subgroup of E cross E prime, Okay, so you have to think of n uh, as being r2 to the e. Well, this is reducible. In other words, quotienting out e cross e prime modulo the subgroup will land on a product of elliptic curves if and only if it comes from such an isogeny diamond configuration of order n. Uh, and this uh, word comes from is a bit technical, uh, but essentially, and this is true in all the uh, versions that we will uh, um, uh, in, in the yeah, at all the for all the instances that will to which we will apply this theorem, it basically means that uh, this group by which you quotient out should be basically the graph of this isogeny restricted to the n torsion. Okay, so what you do is you pick a basis of the n torsion uh, p and q, and then you uh, consider the point p psi of p and q psi of q. So this group. If I ignore the x, is really the graph of uh, psi restricted to the n torsion, but then I have to scale this in an appropriate way uh, to end up with a, a maximally isotropic uh, subgroup. And uh, there is typically up to sign a unique uh, natural candidate for x. So this is uh, this is Kani's, uh, criterion, and we are going to try and use this criterion to force ourselves in a in a in, in this reducible situation. So. Um, we are again going to consider uh, this uh, secret isogeny of Bob um, from E to E prime. And we have these uh, two points of Alice, well, the, but they are public, P A and Q A. And we have the images of uh, Alice's points under Bob's secret isogeny, P A prime and Q A prime. This is the situation. What are we going to do? Well, we are going to uh, hope that we can do the following so that we can find an isogeny of degree c we call it uh, and c is just defined as 2 to the e minus 3 to the f assume for the moment that this is a, a positive integer um uh, let's call this isogeny gamma to some auxiliary curve c okay so any gamma of that degree uh, will do. assume we can find such an isogeny gamma to some curve c we can also compute the images of ea and qa under that secret uh, under that not secret that auxiliary isogeny gamma so let's call these image points PC and QC. So why do we take this degree uh, C? Well, that's to force ourselves into this uh, isogeny diamond uh, configuration of order two to D. What will, what will our isogeny Psi be from the previous slides? It will be this composition. And by this composition, I mean Phi B composed with the dual of gamma. Okay, this is our Psi. And now the kernel of Psi, we have to, uh, Write it as a sum or as a sum of two groups, basically two subgroups. Um, one of these uh, subgroups will be the kernel of the dual of gamma. So this will be uh, our G1. And this is a group of this size. And the uh, other subgroup, well, that will be basically the kernel of, uh, of phi B. Remember, this was called B. Uh, but we have to view it uh, here. So we take gamma of B. Yeah, and that's our G2. And the number of elements here is, uh, let me write it here, this is 2 to the e minus 3 to the f, the number of elements here. Well, we don't know what the isogeny is, but we know its degree, it's 3 to the f. Yeah. And so this is why the degree was chosen as such, because the sum of these two things uh, is 2 to the e. And so uh, we indeed have an isogeny diamond of order 2 to the e. And basically the consequence is that um, if you now consider the graph of psi restricted to the two to the e torsion, but that's precisely uh, the, the group generated by PC and PA prime up to scalar and QC and QA prime up to scalar. And it turns out that the scalar is actually one in this case, um, that this uh, will be a reducible subgroup of C cross E prime. Okay, so we no longer work on E cross E prime, but we work on this. Uh, 
uh, auxiliary curve cross E prime. And the key ideas, so, so we, we have now chosen parameters so that this is indeed irreducible. But then now the question is, what can we do with this? But the key ideas is if that, if it would happen that these points would not be the images of these points under a degree three to the F isogeny, then there is no reason, no a priori reason uh, for this subgroup to be reducible. And because reducibility is such an exceptional event, uh, we would probably not land on a product of elliptic curves. And so as a consequence, we can use this as a, as a kind of decision test. Yeah. We can use uh, uh, this, uh, we can check for the reducibility of the subgroup and conclude from this whether uh, this uh, PA prime QA prime is indeed uh, a valid pair of auxiliary points under, our, under, under the secret degree three to the F isogeny or not, okay? So this is then the uh, candidate method for uh, unveiling uh, the secret walk of Bob. Okay, so Bob, again, we have the starting curve E, we have the codomain curve E prime, we have Bob's secret uh, three to the F isogeny, which we write as a composition of degree three isogenies. We have these uh, points P, A, Q, A of Alice, and we have the images here. And now we would like to reconstruct this part. What are we going to do? Well, we are going to make a guess for the first step. Okay, there are three or four, depending on how you set it up, but in our case, there will be three options for phi one. Uh, and so we have three possible guesses for phi one. So let's make a guess. Let's call this guess phi one question mark. We take this step, we land on a curve E1 question mark. So maybe this is E1, maybe it's not. And we push forward these points, P, we push these points, sorry, PA and QA uh, through this guess. And we land, on, we land on points P1 question mark and Q1 question mark. And now we would like to test, did we make the correct choice? Well, if the guess is correct, then we are actually here, right? And then in that case, uh, E1 question mark and E prime will be connected via an isogeny of degree three to the F minus one. Moreover, well, since PA prime is the image of PA under this chain, it must be the case that PA prime is then the image of P1 question mark under, under what is left of this chain, okay? So this isogeny of degree three to the F minus one is also known to map P1 question mark to PA prime and Q1 question mark to QA prime. So, the idea is, as I explained on the previous slide, we will build this auxiliary isogeny. Note that now this isogeny has to have this degree uh, to an auxiliary curve C. We compute the images of this P1 question mark and Q1 question mark under this auxiliary isogeny, and we consider this subgroup. If the guess was correct, we just explained that we have to land on a product of elliptic curves. And the idea is that if the guess is false, and we can make that more precise, we can't really prove that in full, um, but it, it works in practice. And as I said, the follow-up works actually do a better job on that. Um, but uh, yeah, we can, we can reason at least that uh, if the guess is false, then with overwhelming probability, uh, we will not land on a product of elliptic curves. Okay, so we can really use this reducibility of this subgroup as a decision for whether we took the correct first step or not. Once we have the correct first step, we continue. Yeah, then we again have three guesses for the second step. We play the same game. Um, so we land on a, a candidate for the second curve, E2 question mark. We have candidate points, P2 question mark, Q2 question mark. We now have to construct an auxiliary isogeny of degree two to the E minus three to the F minus two. And we check for reducibility and so on and so on. And this is how we reconstruct the path. Now I still have to explain. So that's, that's the high level uh, idea uh, of this attack. Uh, or actually it, it's not so high level, but I still have to explain uh, a few steps. And the most important step is uh, how do we construct this degree C isogeny? So at the i step, we will have to uh, construct a degree two to the E minus three to the F minus I isogeny, uh, which emanates from uh, EI question mark to some uh, to this auxiliary uh, elliptic curve C. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as we can find an isogeny of that degree. Uh, and that's not a trivial thing to do. And this is actually, um, okay, so let's, um, Let's already mention that um, this is, so this is just a, a part, a copy of, of the image of the previous slide. So uh, at the moment that we are considering EI question mark, we have already 
constructed the correct path up to step uh, i minus one, right? And so we know an explicit isogeny, let's call this tau, this is a composition of three isogenies uh, from E uh, to EI question. Okay, so this is part of the input, and we will use this to construct this uh, auxiliary isogeny gamma. And another crucial ingredient, and this is the crucial ingredient actually, is that this starting curve, uh, I didn't start to take it arbitrarily. I actually uh, didn't mention anything about this, but if you remember, this was the starting curve uh, I took uh, when I explaining uh, the super singular isogeny diffie hamann protocol. And this is a very special uh, super singular elliptic curve in the sense that it comes with extra automorphisms. Namely, it comes with this automorphism, which is a, a square root of minus one. Okay. Um, in the first submission of Psyche, uh, this was uh, this was indeed the starting curve that was used. Uh, in later submissions of Psyche, uh, they switched to another um, uh, elliptic curve, but it comes uh, equipped with a very similar uh, endomorphism. So this this was not to avoid this endomorphism. This work was for different reasons. Uh, so basically, it comes with a, an endomorphism which is. Uh, uh, two i, so a square root of minus four instead of minus one, but that's good enough. Okay, so we are going to exploit this. How are we going to exploit this? Well, we are going to hope, uh, and this is a uh, still a bit of a naive hope, maybe, but it's not not unreasonable. Definitely not for the parameter sizes that we are considering. That this c can be written as a sum of two squares. Okay, for instance, if this c factors uh, into prime factors, all of uh, uh, all of which are one modulo four, we know that C can be written as a sum of two squares. If we can factor C, and this is where these uh, factorizations that I mentioned at the beginning come from, if we can factor C, then we can indeed write, uh, uh, do this efficiently. Yeah. Uh, so there, that's basically uh, Euclid's algorithm of the Gaussian integers. Once we have written C as a sum of two squares, we can consider, for instance, this endomorphism. This is an endomorphism of E, right? So this is scalar multiplication by u plus this uh, i composed with scalar multiplication by v. It's an endomorphism of uh, uh, v. And then using tau, we can push this forward toward degree uh, uh, isogeny. Yeah. So this is basically how you do it. Uh, but that's just a technical thing, but this is very easy. So once you have your uh, degree c isogeny here, uh, you will also have it, uh, have it here. OK. Sorry, I had hoped that uh, this would no longer be here. Let's see. Oh, no, it, it will uh, disappear. OK, so um, as I said, we hope that this is a sum of two squares, but this is still, uh, well, it's not super unlikely, but it's still, uh, still an exceptional event, right? Um, as I said, uh, deciding whether uh, there exists such UV, this comes at the cost of uh, factoring. Uh, but then apart from this factoring, it's very fast. And it only depends on the system parameters. So these are these numbers, they can be factored long beforehand. And so it doesn't depend on the concrete uh, uh, secret keys that you see, uh, uh, the, the concrete public keys of Alice and Bob. Furthermore, if C does not admit such a decomposition, you can create more leeway by reducing E. Because if you know the action of Bob's secret isogeny on the two to the e torsion, you also know it on the two to the e minus j torsion for every uh, value of j, right? So uh, you can play around with this exponent. You can also increase f minus i. How does that work? Well, f was the length of Bob's uh, secret uh, chain of three isogenies, but you can extend that uh, chain if you want uh, with your with your own uh, isogenies, and you will have a, a chain of uh, length. Uh, uh, f minus i plus one or f minus i plus two and so on. Okay, so you can play around with this exponent too. And um, uh, yeah, this creates a bunch of numbers and as soon as one of them uh, can be written as a sum of two squares, uh, you win. Of course, you want these integers to be positive. So uh, you have to, you cannot avoid having to take uh, a few steps, uh, having to take uh, yeah, i uh, of some size so that this, uh, this integer is positive. Okay, so this is the hardest uh, step, uh, and uh, often this this first step takes more than half of the of the time. Okay, if you do the analysis, um, 
and focus merely on sums of two squares, the attack uh, runs in sub-exponential time, L uh, of one fourth. And this is the attack that we actually uh, run in practice. But you can tweak this idea. Uh, instead of working with uh, I, you can work with other uh, small norm endomorphisms. Um, so, and then you can play the same game and you can use known algorithms. Uh, as soon as you know the, uh, the endomorphism ring of the starting curve, there are known algorithms to walk to appropriate curves with small norm endomorphisms. And so you can, if it doesn't split as a sum of two squares, maybe you can write it as u squared plus two times v squared, and then you walk to a different curve. Maybe you can write it as u squared plus three times v squared, you walk to yet another curve and so on. Uh, and so if you play this game, then you uh, you end up with an algorithm that runs in heuristic polynomial time, but again, modulo this factoring. Now, in the case of an unknown endomorphism ring, uh, and uh, Chloe will talk more about this in the next uh, talk, um, you can uh, still play this game of constructing this uh, degree C isogeny if this integer happens to be smooth. Uh, if it happens to factor as a product of small primes, then you can still efficiently, uh, or at least theoretically uh, efficiently construct this auxiliary isogeny. Uh, and again, there are tricks to create more leeway. You can play around with these exponents. You can extend Bob's isogeny. It doesn't even need to be with, uh, with the power of three. And you can also guess the action of uh, uh, Bob's secret isogeny on, uh, on a larger uh, part of the torsion. Okay, so this is uh, written here. Uh, and this leads to uh, an L uh, one half plus epsilon algorithm, but I will mention that uh, uh, in a second. Let me quickly um, mention something about the uh, algorithmic task of uh, computing this chain of two two isogenies. Okay, so this is really what we have to do, right? At, uh, at every step, we have to look at the product of this guess. Well, basically, that's not. This is actually a typo. I would even say this is. It's actually the C, right? Uh, that stands in that from which you uh, you. So you looked at this guess, you construct an isogeny to some ci, I would say, of degree two to the e minus three to the f minus i. And so this x-axis here is a ci, uh, this e prime, you have this two to the e, two to the e subgroup, and uh, you want to check whether it's reducible or not. So you want to check whether the uh, codomain of this two to the e to the e isogeny is a, a Jacobian of a genus two curve or a product of two elliptic curves. Uh, and the typical situation is you will hit the Jacobian, hit the Jacobian, hit the Jacobian, hit the Jacobian, and then at the last step, uh, if the guess was correct, you will run into a product of elliptic curves. If the guess was false, you will uh, run on into another Jacobian. Okay, so we have to take these steps efficiently, and we have to be able to uh, to make this uh, to this to make this decision efficiently. And so, this first step. Uh, is basically gluing a product of two uh, elliptic curves into the Jacobian of a genus two curve via a two two isogeny. Uh, I will not discuss these formulas, but they uh, are very explicit and they were uh, developed by Everett Howe, uh, Frank Le Provost, and uh, Bjorn Koonen in 2000. Uh, so we implement, we just took these formulas basically from that paper and implemented them. Um, and then the other steps are uh, much more classical. Uh, so uh, such steps are called Richelieu isogenies. They go back to the 19th century. Uh, and just uh, if you've never seen them before, uh, I will uh, uh, show them on the next slide. But in any case, the Richelieu isogenies, they will come uh, with a computation of some discriminant at every step. And if that discriminant, and you will have to divide by that discriminant during this iteration. And if that discriminant turns out to be zero, then this division by uh, the discriminant uh, fails. Uh, and that's exactly how you can detect whether you land on a product of elliptic curves or not. So this product of elliptic curves thing will happen exactly if this discriminant vanishes. So that's, that will be a very easy check and a check that you will do implicitly in all these steps anyway. So here's a glimpse at Richelieu if you've never seen this before. Uh, so uh, it's about computing a 2-2 isogeny. Uh, between uh, two, uh, the Jacobians of two uh, genus two curves, H, uh, I and H I plus one. So we write this, uh, this genus two curve H I in the form Y squared equals F of X. Uh, and let's assume uh, that this is a degree six, uh, a square free degree six polynomial. Then the two, two subgroup will always be of this form. Uh, so these are divisor classes here, uh, and uh, these uh, points, uh, 
the x coordinates of those points will be roots of uh, of this f of x and so every uh, point in the 2 2 subgroup or every non trivial point in the 2 2 subgroup uh, gives rise to two roots and so this corresponds to a uh, one quadratic factor okay and uh, actually the maximal isotropy condition is really uh, in this case really amounts to saying that these uh, these six these these three pairs of two points are disjoint so you really get uh, uh, the full factorization of f of x and then the formulas by Richelieu are very explicit once you have this factorization um, you built this, uh, you put the coefficients of these quadratic factors in a matrix, you compute the determinant. That's exactly this delta that uh, we mentioned on the previous slide. And then you can uh, build new quadratic polynomials, taking the deriv derivative of this guy, multiplying with this guy, subtracting uh, this guy times the derivative of this guy, and the leading coefficients will cancel. So you will have a, a degree uh, two polynomial again. And then you have to divide. This is the division I mentioned by this delta. And you do this cyclically. It's OK. So this is uh, 1, 2, 3, then for 2, 3, 1, 3, 1, 2. You do this cyclically. Uh, and then you have a, a new uh, a genus 2 curve. Uh, and the Jacobian of that curve is a codomain of your 2, 2 isogeny, unless this delta is 0, in which case we land on a product of a, on a we land on a product of elliptic curves. Okay, so um, we have implemented this attack in Magma. Um, and uh, so the code is available on my website if you want to experiment with it. And the current run uh, recovers Bob's key for, these are like security levels that were uh, uh, asked for by the NIST uh, competition. Okay, so this is considered, uh, this is considered a paranoid security level, at least if, it, if, it's, uh, if it's secure. Uh, and this is uh, basically uh, the level of AES uh, uh, 128, but then against quantum computers. And the attack, and this attack is completely classical, uh, recovers uh, the secret key, uh, Bob's secret key uh, for level one in about 10 minutes. Uh, up to level five in about three hours. The initial timings were about a factor six slower than this, uh, but Magma, uh, in response to this attack, improved uh, the arithmetic uh, in in quadratic finite fields. So, uh, so they learned, they they uh, updated, uh, they they made an update uh, with improved arithmetic uh, over FP squared, and this uh, this reduced the timings to these uh, uh, timings. But actually, uh, uh, in a parallel effort, uh, so the Magma people did this, but uh, in a parallel effort in the open source source package SageMod, um, uh, uh, I think this was mainly, uh, the initiative was mainly by Giacomo Pope and then uh, Rimi Udom Feng, Lorenz Pani, and I, I, I'm probably forgetting others, uh, have uh, re-implemented this attack in SageMod. Uh, but added uh, quite a few algorithmic improvements. One of these algorithmic improvements is actually very substantial uh, and is about going away from a decisional approach to a, a direct evaluation approach. This is also the approach that Luciano Maino and Chloe Martindale came up with, uh, but that was also uh, uh, discovered independently by Udom Feng, uh, Wiesolowski, uh, so uh, several people, and that uh, uh, takes it down to, I think the current record for site level one is 22 seconds or something. It would be interesting, although of course, uh, uh, we all support uh, the open source uh, uh, aspect of Sage. Uh, the competition between Sage and Magma is also interesting to improve uh, things on both ends. And so it would be interesting to see how uh, improved an improvement of our code would perform in, in Magma. So uh, for the moment, uh, the code only attacks uh, Bob's uh, secret key. Uh, why is that? Well, that's because uh, that allows you to work with two two isogenies, and they are uh, easy uh, to work with. Um, but if you would attack Alice's secret key, then you would uh, try. You would be trying to quotient out a subgroup of of this type. So you would be computing chains of three three isogenies. That is possible. Uh, so there are explicit formulas due to Brian Flynn and Testa. And actually, Thomas is now uh, collaborating with Sabrina uh, Kunzweiler on, on, on making this more efficient. Um, 
but so in theory, there's, there's definitely nothing that stops you from that. And even for uh, higher torsion, as long as it's uh, as it's smooth, I would say uh, this uh, this attack ID applies. So there is a variant of SIDH called B site, which is also broken by this uh, approach. Uh, but this, these attacks have not been implemented. Uh, so in theory, it should be possible to use the AV isogenies package uh, by Bisson, Fosse, and Robert, but uh, this has not uh, happened yet for the moment. Okay, so I'm not sure how I'm doing time-wise, so please uh, stop me uh, if, I'm, if I'm running over time. Uh, but I have a few uh, uh, concluding remarks. So our first one is a direct evaluation approach. I won't say too much about this because uh, this uh, uh, is discussed more extensively in the next talk. Um, but uh, um, yeah, as a, in response to, to our uh, uh, implementation, Udom Fung, Petit, Vesolovsky, and then also, uh, well, then so uh, parallel also Maino and Martinel came up with this uh, direct evaluation approach. Um, so because in every, in every step of our decision process, we have to run up to three chains of two two isogenies, right? We have three options, and for every option, we have to compute a chain of two two isogenies, and there are f steps. Okay, so in the worst case, we have to compute three times f chains of two two isogenies, but actually, it's possible to reduce this to just two chains of two two isogenies. Okay, and so this is uh, this is much better, of course. What is the idea? The idea is to consider this uh, the following diagram. Uh, so um, we have our uh, starting curve E, we have our codomain curve E prime, we have Bob's secret isogeny phi B, we have this auxiliary isogeny gamma, which has to be of degree two to the E minus three to the F. Uh, so for what I'm going to say now, this is basically following Wieselowski. Uh, we still have to be able to, to find this gamma, but once we found it, we can uh, somehow consider the following diagram. We cannot construct it explicitly because we don't know phi of b, but theoretically we can write it down. Uh, and what do we mean by completing the diagram? Well, this gamma has a kernel. We just compute the image of this kernel under phi of b, and we quotient out this uh, uh, image of this kernel. We get gamma prime. Yeah, and so you do the same here. So you have the kernel of phi of b. So this is precisely Bob's secret group b. You take gamma of b, and this is the kernel of uh, phi b. And prime. So if you want, uh, this is the push out of, of these two uh, isogenies. And based on this uh, diagram, you can observe that the dual of phi of, of phi b um, factors as a composition of three uh, uh, isogenies. The first one, well, so three, three maps, say. I have to be careful with the word isogenies for this uh, projection map, for instance. Uh, but as a, as a composition of these maps, what happens? Well, we have a, a point x on E prime. We send it to uh, neutral element comma x here. So we put it in the second component here. Then we apply this matrix map. OK, so you really have to read this as uh, if I apply this to, say, PQ, you have to gamma hat of p plus uh, phi b hat of q just like you would evaluate a matrix product and so uh, apply to uh, infinity x gives you uh, uh, this uh, outcome and then you just project on the first coordinate okay so you see that uh, phi b hat indeed factors uh, like so and now the cool thing is that this uh, middle uh, isogeny it can be verified to be an isogeny really of principally polarized abelian surfaces because one has to be a bit careful with just writing down matrices uh, for maps between products of elliptic curves and hoping that this will all work out nicely in the category of, uh, of principally polarized abelian surfaces. But uh, there are ways to, uh, to handle this, and this turns out to be of, of, of the good kind. And one can explicitly write down its kernel. And the cool thing is that one, yeah. This is not only in theory, uh, all the ingredients of the kernel, we, we really know it. Yeah. So uh, we really can, um, can uh, if you look at the start from the two to the e torsion here, uh, you need uh, basically to, to be able to compute this. So gamma hat and then uh, phi b, but phi b, you know it's action on the two to the e torsion. So you can write down this point. So you can quotient out this kernel. In other words, you can compute this map, uh, but then, you can also compute phi b hat, okay? And so um, 
basically what you do is you use this uh, principle to evaluate phi b hat on a basis on the three to the f torsion. So once you have phi b hat, you can evaluate it on a basis of the three to the f, f torsion. Uh, sorry, we are here. Uh, and then you can determine the kernel by just uh, some linear algebra. Uh, so these are the two uh, evaluations, right? This is the, the two chains of two, two isogenies that go into here. Uh, and then it's just linear algebra and you can really recover. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a very elegant and uh, a better approach. And this is, for instance, something that went into the 22 seconds that I already mentioned. In the but I guess this is already outdated. Uh, well, of course, there's not really a point in pushing this uh, down as far as you can, but uh, I just wanted to mention it. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, our condition that we had on factoring these integers C, you can actually get rid of it. Uh, so you don't need this uh, this factorization. This was pointed out uh, by Wisolowski. Um, you don't need to assume any special form of C. Uh, and and this uh, the reasoning by Wisolowski is actually much more rigorous. So he really has a proof that the algorithm works in expected polynomial time. And the only unproven ingredient is, uh, is the generalized Riemann hypothesis. So this uh, puts this on a much more solid uh, grounds. Um, then, yeah, this I already mentioned. So by playing around with these uh, parameters, you uh, you you break SIDH without known endomorphism ring in sub-exponential time. This was pointed out to us by Defeo and Wisolowski independently. But this is now uh, somewhat uh, overruled, uh, although maybe not in practice, but definitely in theory, theory by uh, Robert. Uh, so Damien Robert, he came up with, a, with an unconditional polynomial time attack. Um, it's similar to uh, the direct evaluation approach that I mentioned um, two slides before. And it also uses uh, something that is reminiscent of uh, uh, Zarin's trick. Uh, so it uh, goes to four times the dimension. So instead of working with uh, abelian surfaces, as we do, he works with abelian uh, eight folds. Uh, very concretely, the idea is that uh, this C, so remember this is this uh, 2 to the E minus 3 to the F, uh, you can always write it as a sum of four squares, and uh, at least heuristically this is uh, easy to do, okay, so basically you take random, uh, two squares at random, and you hope uh, that what, what is left over is a, is a sum of two squares, and you, you have many chances of, for success. Uh, and then, um, once you have this, you can write down this matrix. Basically, this is the matrix of multiplication uh, in, uh, in the standard quaternions uh, of left multiplication in the standard quaternions with uh, this element. So that's how you can remember what this matrix is. Um, but the crucial property is that uh, that matrix times its transpose equals that uh, the transpose times the matrix equals just uh, a diagonal matrix C, C, C. Okay. Using this, you can uh, write down this endomorphism. So we are really, we are no longer using an auxiliary curve. We are really, this is the starting curve. This is the ending curve. And we can write down this endomorphism. Um, and how should you read this? Well, this is an eight by eight matrix now. This upper left block is, is this M. This lower uh, right block is the transpose of this M. And this is just uh, a diagonal evaluation. And so on, and, and similarly uh, here, you can write this down. Uh, you can check out that this is the dual, and um, basically you can check that this is really an endomorphism of e to the fourth uh, cross e prime to the fourth as a principally polarized abelian uh, eightfold. And you can check, and this is uh, yeah, this is just an explicit calculation. I will not do it here, uh, but this is again where this uh, c comes into play. Uh, that its kernel lives in the inside the two to the e torsion. Okay. And so we can really explicitly compute the kernel from torsion point information because we have the action of all the components on the two to the e torsion. And once we have the kernel, we can really uh, uh, evaluate f explicitly and evaluating f explicitly as a subroutine or as a sub as a part uh, means that you have access to 5e, to Bob's secret isogeny.
Yeah, so this is really uh, uh, very nice. Uh, and uh, yeah, and and uh, at some point, uh, right after our attack, there was some hope that um, that SIDH could be saved by working with a starting curve with an uh, uh, with an unknown endomorphism ring. Uh, but then quickly, uh, yeah, it was clear that at least this would be weakened. Um, but now, uh, since this work by Robert, this uh, this hope is completely crushed. Yeah. And Robert also has some constructive uh, applications of uh, all these ideas, uh, for instance, uh, about uh, compact uh, representations of high degree isotopes and so on. So um, this is really a, a nice paper to read. Um, and this is the last thing that I wanted to say. So my apologies for running over time a little bit. And uh, thanks for uh, uh, listening.